So this is a presentation that I did to kind of um, explain uh, design versus art uh, within the context of, um, of the company I'm, I'm working at. And it was the idea here was essentially, you know, to kind of differentiate um, the fact that both design and, and art um, are creative aspects of one's persona, but they're different in, in very distinct ways, especially with the kind of work that I do. So this kind of led to the issue of like, what exactly is the difference, difference between the two? And I found that in a lot of ways, art does pose a question and it's more open-ended and design answers a question whether it's communication design, which directs people to information or an answer, or if it's product design, where I'm actually trying to move the user into an experience to, in my case, show them television and film. Um, and then it just kind of got me the idea that what's interesting about creativity, uh, in addition to requiring contemplation, is that it requires freedom. And the only way you can have freedom in any kind of environment or group environment is if you have um, an environment which understands creative thinking and is not threatened by it. Um, even though we often talk about innovation and we talk about creativity uh, within a corporate environment, and whether you're working in a company or you're working in an agency that's servicing a company, there's a general sense of fear around the disruptive nature of creativity. Creatives, whether they're designers or innovators in general, are both needed in a company and also a little bit isolated. There's a tendency to kind of go, thank you, we'll take it from here. And what I, I realized when I was building a design team is that I needed to build a fear-free environment. And I had to kind of get away from the idea that the creative director was the final answer on everything. And so what we ended up doing is building an environment with, you know, you know as Kim Scott says, radical candor, but the ability to have more of a flat environment. So my role is actually to help Define, define vision within my group, but also really to help the people on my team become more engaged um, in their work. So when you do have creativity, then you do have the actual word innovation become relevant within the context of the company. Um, because at this point, you can start developing models that actually disrupt the actual business you're in, but you don't have to do that necessarily in that point. You can do it later on but you have to build an environment so that people can feel safe to actually make really bad ideas and prototype and think quickly and iterate over and over. It's good for the business, it's good for the designer. So what I wanted to show here um, is a painting that I did uh, for a Japanese mountain monk of the Shugendo um, religion uh, in Nara. And I had met this man named Matsubayashi-san and he had asked me to do a painting for him. And I will reveal the painting later on, but the cover of my book is the handprint in which I signed the painting for him. Now Shugendo, um, for you, those of you who don't know, is actually a 1300 year old syncretic religion in Japan, which means, syncretic means it's actually combined of multiple different religions of Taoism, Zen Buddhism, and Shinto. And the handprint was a way of connecting, you know, saying I'm done and then putting it into what's called qi or qi in Chinese of energy into the actual finished painting. Um, the handprint itself in a lot of ways is something which is both childlike. It's the most common thing that children do when they first, you know, play around with paints, but it's also one of the most ancient symbols that goes back 10, 20, 30,000 years to cave paintings. It's a way of, uh, you know, if you look here, you can see in Argentina going back 13,000 years, Indonesia going back 35,000 years. And I thought it was fascinating that the hand was used because the hand is an extension of the mind. It's an extension of the soul. And this is a way of in essentially saying that I am here, that I have been here, that this is my mark. So the, the connection between art and design um, is that there's a lot of prototyping and drawing initially. And within design and within product design, I do a lot of sketching. In this case, I'm just showing you kind of a snapshot of the sketches that were done for the painting of Zhao Gonggen. And Zhao Gonggen is a blue-skinned fanged deity holding um, a Vajra, which is a Buddhistic uh, symbol, which vanquishes ignorance. And it comes from um, 
India originally. So Zhao Gongen is actually a combination of multiple different kinds of beliefs into one entity. And he's considered to be a vanquisher of ignorance and a vanquisher of anger, in spite of the fact that he looks angry, much like the gargoyles were in medieval times. Um, so here's some pictures of you know, me actually working on the painting. You can see in the lower left-hand corner, the work in progress is a six feet tall piece. And then that's kind of a quick shot of the guy himself. I'll show you a bigger picture later. But the hand print here that I use also in Buddhism is the mudra or the hand symbol for fearlessness. And as I was writing The Art of Creative Rebellion, I wanted to make sure that symbolically the hand not only was an extension of the mind and soul, but also an extension of fearlessness, in which we all need. And creative courage is probably the underlying uh, theme throughout the whole book, because whenever you are creating, you're stepping into the unknown, you're stepping into a state of the tabula rasa, and you're pulling something out of nothing, which is an extremely amazing thing that you're actually putting something out that has not ever been there before. That requires courage, and it requires the ability to expose yourself, and it requires the ability to put it out in front of human beings in a way that we have all found you know, to be extraordinarily challenging at times. So this is the actual final painting with a handprint, and you can see uh, the, the mountain monk, Matsubayashi san, standing in front of the painting. Ironically, the painting was originally meant for a house uh, that was being refurbished on his properties, which was done in the ancient Japanese style with a thatched roof, but people couldn't sleep in the same room with it because they found it to be too, too disturbing. So he ended up putting it in his office because he's also a CEO in addition to being a mountain monk. And then he would use it almost as a litmus test to see how people reacted to the painting when, and decide whether he was going to do business with them or not, depending on whether they uh, reacted to the painting, paid attention to the painting, or just ignored it altogether. So all this is kind of a lead into um, the book itself, which uh, I call The Art of Creative Rebellion, because I do believe that rebellion um, is necessary, especially in this day and age where we need creative thinking more than ever. Rebellion by its very nature and creativity by its very nature questions the status quo. And right now we need questioning of the status quo in politics more than ever in the way that uh, Errol had mentioned as in terms of like how we actually see our world and the innovation that we saw Michelle demonstrate in her work. So this is some of the uh, principles from the book itself. And uh, the paintings on the left are actually uh, paintings that I did quickly to kind of counterbalance the very stark nature of the words. I wanted to have something which is more organic. And it's my belief that if you stick to principles and you have to develop principles, you will survive and you will thrive over time. And it took me a long time you know, and I did want to be prescriptive in the book of saying, here, here are principles you should adhere to. I was simply saying, here are my principles, because what had started out as being kind of like letters to a young poet, you know, and its intention turned out to be kitchen confidential, but for designers. And I knew, knew the more that I talked about actual experiences that I had, the more that people would relate to the stories themselves. Um, the other thing that I realized uh, when I was learning over time how to build teams is that this is a Peter Drucker quote, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And Peter Drucker, in case you don't know, was a famous managerial expert and how you build teams and how you get things done. And it, it's been interesting. So every time I've hired, I've always made sure that in addition to having craft, that the personalities of the people that are being brought into the team mesh well with each other. Uh, because we can only, even though you come up with great ideas and contemplative environments by yourself, you need a group to actually then amplify and add to it and actually mutate it in a way that you had no idea that it should have been or could have been. And this requires one's ego to be not only diminished in one level, but macroscopically expanded to a point that actually it doesn't matter. The point is to make something that's extraordinary. And this is a group shot of my team. I have a relatively large team, both in um, Santa Monica and Seattle. And literally, this is kind of the behavior they have throughout the whole day, which I encourage. Um, the other thing that I realized is that when you're doing anything that's new, there's an initial state of resistance and discomfort. And we're all in that state right now, um, given the coronavirus situation. And 
the first reaction tends to be contraction, that one goes, oh my God, things are not the same, what do I do? And you'll see both in humans and also in companies, a tendency to get very conservative and pull everything in and, and no longer do the things that they think are not necessary for survival. But I think, again, that if you can flow with what is and accept the reality of what is and not resist it, then you're able to then deal with it. But if there's always a resistance to what actually is happening around you, there's a tendency to then just wish it away and that just makes you even more miserable. But if you actually say, okay, this is what has happened. How do I now build my system around it? And um, for me, it still requires getting up early in the morning to uh, write. And I was able to still maintain that habit of writing in the morning, uh, designing throughout the day and then painting at night. And then also I have a wife and daughter that I have to you know, spend time with as well. Um, the other thing I tell my designers is that you're spending eight to 10 hours a day at work and you're not gonna get it back. And yes, you're gonna get paid every couple of weeks and you're gonna get insurance, which we know is incredibly important, but life is going away from you. And if you're not engaged with what you're doing, you are literally losing life and no amount of money will ever fix that. So of course we have to pay the bills, we have to pay for groceries. But a huge reason why I am extremely adamant of pushing my design team and anybody who works with me to do something beyond their day job is to realize that they are always bigger than the company they work at. As a human being, you are always larger than the title you have and the company you work at, and you're gonna be spending time within a company. But I make no illusions about myself that once I have left a company, that I have, I'm, not, I'm not replaceable. I'm incredibly replaceable, we all are. And um, it's not to be dire, but to make sure that you realize that the most important things in your life are actually the things you do that are not work. You know? And then that's a hard thing. We have this very work ethic that thinks, well, if I'm not doing something that's making money, then I'm indulging myself because I should also be spending time with other people and if I'm not doing that, but the actuality is that we spend a lot of time with mental health um, and physical health, but we don't do a lot with creative health. And the only way you can be creatively healthy is to kind of go back to the quote that Errol said that creativity is done in solitude. Um, again, another shot at the, at the team. Um, and I also feel like creativity is often done through the actual making of something, the actual doing of something. You, you can think about a design forever, or you can think about writing a book forever, and you can talk about it, but actually everything changes. It's like having a strategy going into war, but once, you know, the, you know it was it Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched, you know, like, and then suddenly everything changes, right? So the ability to not only think about what you like to do, but to start slopping it in there and making a mess and being completely unafraid of looking like you're exposed. In fact, the more exposed you are and the more uncomfortable you are, you're probably on the right thing. The other thing I really advocate is passion over fear. Uh, it's so much motivation in modern society is out of fear of like what can go horribly wrong. And that's our natural survival instinct, you know, because our DNA is geared towards the idea that we have to make sure that we are going to survive in spite of any kind of challenges around us you know like the one time that you see a, a, an object in the road in front of you it could be a stick or it could be a snake but your instinct is to make sure is to think it's a snake until you finally realize it's actually a stick and i'm not saying to be foolhardy but have um acknowledge fear in oneself but also realize that what's more creative and more powerful and more expansive is passion and what's even more powerful than that is love on the very expansive level and love, not in the amorous sense of the word, but love in the complete and radical acceptance of who you are in this moment and the radical acceptance of the world as it is. And then ultimately, I think that the, the, the trick is to really make what seems extraordinary into a daily practice. So it takes baby steps, but if you want to do something, anything, whether it's play the piano, learn to play the piano no matter how old you are or learn how to design or learn how to draw, do a little bit every day and the extraordinary becomes normal and normalizes through the practice itself. 
And then ultimately, I think this is something as designers, we all can appreciate, you know, design your life in the same way, you know, that you would design a project for anybody else. You are the brand, you are the mechanism that you should be investing in as well. And then ultimately, especially during these times, it's difficult to feel calm about things. Playing is essential. And playing with your creativity, but also literally I've been doing exploding kittens with my daughter uh, for the last several nights and um, throw through a burrito and all the different things that they have. Being able to like realize that things are difficult, but also to break that mold and that pattern of thinking. So I'll leave you with, you know, again, the final picture here. Um, to me, Zhao Gongen represents creative courage. He also represents kindness. And I think ultimately when people have asked me like, what's the most important takeaway uh, as a design leader that you can leave with people? I think it's actually having creative courage, but tempering that with extreme kindness because we're all going through not only social pain and financial pain and health pain, but we're going through internal pain and acknowledging that I think is one of the most incredible ways that we can do to actually connect to each other and get us all through this unusual period we're going through right now. So with that, I will, I will take a breath and stop. <laughs>